Uh, what a delight to have our first baptism today. Um, felt very church planting style baptism. We were paddling pool, tried to fill it with garden hose, didn't really work, so we ended up filling it with buckets. So um, it's happened though. Men got baptised, which is great. Um, really exciting. And we, and we know as well that we've got um, more baptisms uh, coming up in July, on the 3rd of July. Um, I think it's the third. Um, and if you want to get baptised and you haven't been yet, we'd love to talk to you um, more about that. We know we've got at least one on that day, but we're hoping there'll uh, be some others as well. So exciting opportunity uh, for you as well if you haven't taken that step. Um, so we're currently in a series looking at the Old Testament book of Nehemiah. And today we come to uh, Nehemiah chapter 4. And just to kind of put a bit of perspective on what we're going to look at today, uh, during our time in Oxford, so uh, that's where Jim and I came from before we moved here, just um, nearly two years ago now. Um, Jim and I, as part of our time there, I was a pastor in the church there, and we started and led a uh, second site or a second congregation for the church. Uh, that we were leading at a time, so it was a congregation that met in a different part of the city at a different time. And as we went about this, we gathered a group of people, we started to pray about what God wants us to do, and one of the things we started to pray for very early on was that God would provide us a venue. We kept praying, and we kept praying, and we looked at over 100 venues, and we kept praying, <laughs> we kept praying, uh, and still we didn't have a venue. And to be honest, along the way, some of the real frustration wasn't just like the general amount of venues that we were having to look at uh, to try and find one, but also there was uh, at least three places that actually explicitly said they could hire the venues. Two even sent us paperwork to sign. Um, and then they suddenly pulled out. And in both situations, they made it explicitly clear it was because of what we stood for and believed as a church. No one asked me what we stood for as believed as a church, and I checked our website. There wasn't really enough information there to gain anything about what we stood for and believed as a church. So uh, it was making quite a lot of assumptions. I'm not really quite sure what it was that we stood for as believed as a church, but they made it quite explicitly clear that's why they weren't going to hire to us. Um, and yeah, we weren't interested in any kind of legal battles or the, <laughs> all kinds of rules kind of breaking by making that clear to us. But. Um, we obviously just was never going to be a happy relationship, so we just kind of moved on and thought maybe you're not the right place to meet. But it felt like a time of like real opposition in trying to find this breakthrough of a venue. We, and we finally got one as we kept praying and praying, uh, and we only got it confirmed like two weeks before that site was about to launch. Um, and actually we're, we're starting a journey here, we're starting to look for a new venue here at the moment. Uh, and I'm really praying it won't be like that, but we won't have to uh, keep going and going and uh, be left till two or three weeks before some important date before we actually get it. Uh, but I've called today's talk, Expect Trouble. So if you're hoping for a, like, a nice, <laughs> uplifting, kind of uh, baptismal talk, uh, it's not quite that, to be honest. Expect Trouble. Um, I'm, yeah. It's a, a talk full of joy. So we come to part of Nehemiah today where he and the people of God experience some serious opposition. So just to put you into the story a little bit, Nehemiah um, had been living in exile from his homeland and from his home city of Jerusalem. He was in Susa and um, he'd been saddened to discover the state of his home city, Jerusalem. Um, he gained the permission of the king of all the Persian Empire, King Artaxerxes, to go and rebuild the walls of Jerusalem, which were lying in ruins. So that's why it like, saddened him about the city, and he bravely really sought permission to go and rebuild these walls. And they'd done that, and they journeyed, he journeyed to Jerusalem, they started rebuilding, and we get today to chapter 4, where we see Nehemiah and the people of God face some really serious opposition to getting on with this rebuilding. Sam Ballot, uh, a local governor, and Tobiah, who seems to have been Sam Ballot's servant, they mock Nehemiah and the people as they try to rebuild. And this is like they were mocking and jeering them. It wasn't like in the sense of humour, they were doing it because they were really angry and trying to put them off building. And they, uh, they're just angry that the Jews have returned, that they're rebuilding, and they express it in mocking and jeering, using it to intimidate. And there's this moment where Nehemiah prays really powerfully, and if we have more time together this morning, we'd unpack that as well. But we've actually, over the last few weeks, looked quite a lot at how Nehemiah was a man of prayer. So um, we'll leave that one to one side for this morning. 
and they keep going and the wall of the city gets to half the height and then that's where we're going to read from. So Nehemiah 4 verse 7. But when Sambalat, Tobiah, the Arabs and the Ammonites and the people of Ashdod heard that the repairs of Jerusalem walls had gone ahead and the gaps were being closed, they were very angry. Now, if we read the first bit, you'd have read in verse 1 of chapter 4 that they were angry. Now they're very angry. The anger is building. They all plotted together to come and fight against Jerusalem and stir up trouble against it. But when we prayed to our God and posted the guard day and night to meet that threat, Meanwhile, the people of Judah said, the strength of the laborers is giving out. There is so much rubble that we cannot rebuild the wall. Also, our enemies said, before they know it or see us, we'll be right there among them and we'll kill them and put an end to the work. Then the Jews who lived near came and told us ten times over, wherever you turn, they will attack us. So there's clearly fear building amongst the people as to what would happen. Therefore, I stationed some people behind the lowest parts of the wall and the exposed places, posting them by families with their swords and their spears and their bows. And after I looked things over, I stood up and said to the nobles and the officials and the rest of the people, don't be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome and fight your families, your sons and your daughters and your wives and your homes. When our enemies heard this, they were aware of their plot and that God had frustrated it. We all returned to the wall, each to our own work. From that day on, half the men did the work, while the other half were equipped with spears and shields and bows and armor, and the officers posted themselves behind all of the people of Judah who were building the wall. Those who carried the materials did their work with one hand and held a weapon in the other, and each builder wore his sword at his side as he worked. But the man who sounded the trumpet stayed with me. Then I said to the nobles, the officials, and the rest of the people, the work is extensive and spread out. We are widely separated from each other along the wall. Wherever you hear the sound of the trumpet, join us there. Our God will fight for us. So we continued the work with half the men holding spears from the first light of dawn till the stars went out. At that time, I also said to the people, have every man and his helper stay inside Jerusalem at night so they can serve as guards by night and as workers by day. Neither I nor my brothers nor my men nor the guards with me took off their clothes. Each had his weapon even when he went for water. So the first point I want to make, like I said, not a particularly cheery one, is there will be trouble. So initially, Sam Ballot and the others tried to simply intimidate uh, Nehemiah and all those building and tried to put them off by mocking and jeering. That didn't work. So instead, they plotted to actually come and fight against them. Now, we're never, yet not quite sure from the text whether they actually ever really intended to fight or whether that was really just the continuation of the intimidation tactics. Because it would have been quite a brave move for them to fight because the king of the Persian Empire had given Nehemiah permission to do this. So they would have been taking on the orders uh, of the authorities in the Persian Empire. However, still intimidating, because King Artaxerxes had given permission for this wall to be rebuilt, was 50 days travel time away. So it's not like there was gonna be a sudden, like someone's going against your word kind of thing going on here. It'd been quite a long time to get some help. So it's definitely something that was incredibly intimidating. They all plotted together to come and fight against Jerusalem and stir up trouble against it. So whatever the exact intention, they definitely did stir up trouble against Jerusalem. It led to the Jews being discouraged about the state of the walls, intimidated and fearful that they would be attacked. They were ready to give in, really. And I wonder sometimes in our Western church setting, whether we put out quite, I don't know, it's on purpose or by accident half the time, an impression that if you give your life to Jesus, then everything will be okay that everything will be all right. And the challenge with that kind of message is you just can't find it in the Bible. It's not really what the Bible teaches. And Jesus himself says in John 16, 33, I have told you these things so that you may have peace. Fine, we like that bit. In this world, you will have trouble. We like that bit less. <laughs> like, but take heart, I have overcome the world. So I've told you these things so you may have peace. 
what things was he telling them out? Basically, he was telling them about how he was going to ascend to be with the Father. He was going to send the Holy Spirit as the helper uh, to equip them, to empower them to live for him. He was also giving massive hints about how he was going to have to die on the cross. Um, those were the things that were being talked about. So I love this verse as it's real, but it's also full of so much encouragement at the same time. It's very realistic. In this world, you will have trouble. So the trouble bit, first of all, why do we expect trouble in this world? Well, I want to offer two reasons. You could give loads more, but two. One, we live in a broken world that will only be fully restored when Jesus returns again. There is no like VIP pass out of the ups and the downs and trials and the joys of this life. We get it the same as everyone else, the realities of living in the broken worlds. There's no get out of jail free card just because you become a Christian from the challenges of life. Secondly, we have a real enemy that the Bible calls Satan or the devil and all the evil forces that work with him. The enemy is about intimidation, he's about discouragement. In fact, he's up for pretty much any trick or lie that will seek to derail your life in God. John Bunyan, a famous writer in a book called Pilgrim's Progress, says this, the believer that is resolved for heaven, if Satan cannot win him by flatteries, he'll endeavor to weaken him by discouragements. That's the reality of what the enemy's about. I don't want to focus there too much, though. Let's not give him too much credit, because it says here, Jesus has overcome the world. This means, in essence, He's overcome all that is bad in the world. At the cross, he took on a mocking Satan, sin and death, and he won a great victory over them, conquering them, defeating them, so that any who come to him can be restored to relationship with the Heavenly Father. Have the stuff and what's wrong in our lives dealt with, our sin, which is not just what we do wrong, but also intentionally choosing to ignore our Creator. All of that can be dealt with at the cross in Jesus and we can be restored to relationship with a loving Father. So that any who come to Jesus can know the peace as well that's spoken about in this verse. I've told you these things so that you may have peace. Peace being more just actually an absence of war or like some sense of tranquility. I don't know what image you get when you think about peace. Maybe you think about like sitting by the beach and hear the sea rolling in and out and some kind of sense of peace and that's nice for sure but the, the bible means so much more when it talks about peace than that kind of image it means as well peace in the bible kind of carries this sense of being made complete being made whole and more specifically being made complete and whole in jesus as he restores us and makes peace between us and god because of what jesus has done we can know peace with God and experience peace in our heart. So anyone who comes to him can know that. So in this life, we're to expect trouble. As well as the realities of living in broken worlds, we will experience moments when the enemy tries to flatter us, intimidate us, discourage us. And yeah, it's perhaps not so fun to talk about some of this, but I think it's vitally important to be aware of. And the reason why, uh, perhaps a reason why many Christians get this railed in the Western world at some point, because they haven't been aware that they are to expect challenges at times in their life. On our journey to moving to Sheffield, we uh, experienced, uh, what we came to see is a number of attacks on our health as a family. And uh, initially, like, we didn't see it that way, but as it kind of kept happening, we began to realize that we felt it was kind of the enemy was at work there, really. Both our boys spent quite significant time in the hospital, and, uh, and particularly for our younger one, that all started around the time we decided in our hearts that we were going to move. And then both Jude and I experienced ill health as well. And for me, I was, um, I, I had to have a biopsy on my mouth to check if I had mouth cancer. And I was having that done just weeks before we were due to gather a group of people uh, to talk to them about moving with us. And in my heart, I was like, oh. Like, this is really tough. Like, I'm wondering if I might have cancer. And, like, to be honest, like, it wasn't like they're giving me the worst diagnosis ever. I don't want to, like, oversell the situation to make it tell a better story. But even so, in my mind, I just felt so intimidated. Like, like, I'm trying to call people to come with me to move to Sheffield, and I don't really know if I'm going to be well enough to do it. 
Um, and it all turned out all right. Due to the pandemic, it took me a very long time to actually uh, hear back. Um, so it wasn't actually until just before we actually moved that we knew that I definitely didn't have cancer. I began to realise that the fact they hadn't contacted me, it must be okay, but I hadn't actually had the all clear. Um, so it was quite a, a painful and intimidating moment. And the enemy works on these dirty tactics. That's how he works. We aren't to expect an easy life. We're to expect trouble, to expect intimidation, and attempts to discourage our mission. So our mission looks slightly different to Nehemiah's. Our mission here, talking for us here in our context of the manual, but hopefully if you, you go to a different church elsewhere, hopefully you can work this out into your context. For us, we're seeking to build healthy church family together here for the sake of our city so that we can demonstrate the love and hope of Jesus through our everyday lives. Nehemiah, along with many others, sought to build, rebuild the walls of his city. And we long to build a church that contributes and brings life to our city. Alongside all the other great churches and uh, good people who are already doing things to seek similar aims, we know we're not about doing this on our own, we've got a big mission. Above all else, perhaps, we want to help people meet Jesus to encounter his life-transforming presence, to know his peace in their hearts and to flourish in his purposes. And we desire that not just for individuals, but actually our heart is to see the whole of Sheffield flourishing, to see communities around us flourishing as we seek to live for him. But as I say, our heart above all is that we see many people meeting Jesus. So as we seek to go about what God is calling us to do, what encouragements, we look to the difficult side, like, what encouragements can we get from here to go about living for Jesus? I'm going to do two. You're, you're lucky, really. I could have done, like, eight or nine easily. <laughs> um, there's so much in this passage, but I'm just going to do two. Like, prayer and unity are two I'm not doing, but could have been huge points you could have made from this passage. So, one, remember Jesus. Going back to what Nehemiah, he says in verse 14, don't be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who's great and awesome. Remember the Lord who's great and awesome. Uh, if you've known Jesus for a little while, this might seem like a really obvious point. However, I think for all of us, in moments of chaos, in moments of crisis, it's so easy to suddenly forget and be intimidated by what's going on. We heard the story from Jen earlier about what happened in their house when water came pouring in. And she described that exact process uh, as she was uh, sharing earlier of how she had to choose to remember Jesus in those moments and turn to him. It's so easy in those kind of moments, perhaps even far lesser moments than what we're seeing in this story here today, to let our minds suddenly get clouded and we forget all about the bigger picture of what we're part of and what Jesus has done. Uh, Paul says to Timothy in the New Testament, remember Jesus Christ raised from the dead. If Timothy, like one of the heroes of the New Testament, has to be reminded to remember Jesus, then we probably do as well. Like, bring it into our everyday life. To give you an example of just my day by day, and the reality is that uh, like I'm the same as anyone else. Uh, uh, so there's a point joined this week when I was experiencing a bit of anxiety, to be honest, just around how much I had to fit into my week. I was just like, I've got more to be than I can possibly be. And this just kind of clouded into my mind. Like I started to think illogical things that weren't really true. And I just found that I needed to take myself away. I was sitting at my desk trying to work. And I was like, this is just silly. I'm trying to get stuff done. I'm not really getting anything done. I'm not making the situation any better. Um, I'm just winding myself up really. So what I did is I removed myself from that room and went up to the top of our house where we've got a bit of a view over Sheffield and just prayed and chose to remember Jesus. And as the Bible promises, I experienced his peace coming into my heart as I did that. That's a very everyday situation. And I realise that life isn't always that simple. I don't want you going away thinking that I'm making some kind of claim. You just have to pray and it'll be all right. It's not always that simple. And this isn't a one-off thing either. It's more like a repeated choosing to remember Jesus as different things come up in our lives. However, there is incredible power in moments of crisis, in moments of challenge, of actively choosing to remember Jesus. And as we do that, as we fix our gaze on Jesus and remember who he is and what he's done, 
Do you know what? The real power comes because our hearts get drawn into worship. And our hearts also then get reminded of what that means for us. Because of what Jesus has done, it allows space for the Holy Spirit to remind us that we're daughters, that we're sons of a loving father. With Jesus as our victorious older brother. An identity that's not earned by our performance or how well it's really going, but one like Jesus at the cross on our behalf. And maybe this morning you don't know Jesus in that kind of way. Or well, that kind of relationship with Jesus, where you can interact with him and speak to God as your loving father, is open to absolutely anyone who's willing to come to him and commit their life to following on to him. So it needs, in moments of challenge, to consciously choose to remember Jesus. And then second point I want to make this morning is persevere with the bigger mission. So the workers carry on working, uh, but they do so always ready in case of attack, always prepared. It says they carried the materials in one hand and they carried the weapon in the other. That's how like fearful they were of being attacked. They were ready, but they carried on going with the work. They even slept in their clothes at night in case they got attacked uh, during the night. They were continually ready. And Nehemiah tells the people, God will fight for us. He knew, although it was needed for them to exert themselves and work hard for this work to get built, ultimately that God's will would prevail. He would achieve his purposes. And we can similarly know that with challenges and setbacks we face, in our lives personally, and also looking at the bigger picture of God's kingdom, he will achieve his purposes. You haven't backed the wrong team. There will ultimately be only one winner. There will be only one kingdom one day that matters, and it will be Jesus' kingdom. And also, it is just worth bearing in mind that our fight isn't against other people. It's against the enemy and all forces of evil in this world. Our fight isn't against people. It's not hard as well to be impressed by the incredible transformative effect that one single believer's perseverance in faith has. The effect that Nehemiah has on the rest of his people by choosing to persevere, by choosing to keep trusting God no matter what. He too could have got discouraged and been like, nah, this is just too much. It's too dangerous. It's too risky. But he keeps going. He keeps persevering. Arguably, if it wasn't for him, it seems unlikely that they would have persevered and keep going and built the wall. Raymond Brown says in his commentary about Nehemiah, in our contemporary leadership vacuum, the media's passion is simply to reflect society, not to elevate it. A former professor at the London School of Economics says, Influenced by secularism, we have been liberated to follow our impulses so that anything fixed is rejected as a barrier to the one grand and impossible project of building a life in which everyone enjoys the perfect satisfaction of needs. It's an unattainable goal, and those who pursue it are doomed to frustration. Personal satisfaction is a byproduct which can only be obtained by embracing two greater priorities honouring God and loving our neighbour. Mid-5th century Jerusalem was privileged to have at the centre of its life a communicator with integrity and passion. He urged his contemporaries to remember the Lord who is great and awesome and not allow the subtle, alien and corrupting influences to undermine their faith and sabotage their values. It's been, it's been quite sad at times actually to watch some of the response of the, the wider church in the UK um, during the pandemic. Um, we've, seen across the whole church in the UK quite a number of people drift away from Jesus in the church and some of that has been for a variety of reasons we've been perhaps a, a bit more immune to it here as a new church that started in the middle of the pandemic you weren't going to join the new church if you're drifting away from it so in a way that's kind of a blessing but it's been sad from a distance to watch people drifting from Jesus for all kinds of reasons some who've completely deconstructed their faith and got questions uh, about it all and just unpacked it all and questioning uh, yeah, big questions around Jesus himself. For others, they've just decided it's got too hard and it, it's just easier not to bother with the hard work of coming to church on a Sunday morning, which I don't think is really that hard. Um, and the, the challenges of it all, they've just, just given it up. They haven't said they're not giving up on Jesus, but they're nowhere to be seen in the church body anymore. You see, when we start living to uh, meet our perfect satisfaction of our needs rather than for the greater purpose of God's mission. 
It just doesn't really work. It doesn't add up. Nehemiah's plans only work as they work together, and we aren't supposed to live for Jesus on our own, but we're supposed to do it amongst local church family. Personal satisfaction is actually a byproduct anyway, which can only be attained by uh, embracing two greater priorities, honouring God and loving our neighbour. We're designed in our very makeup to live for something bigger than ourselves. We only find satisfaction in living wholeheartedly for Jesus and his purposes. And what you're going after, the ultimate goal that you end up going for, if you go for just satisfaction of all your needs, it's going to end up letting you down. Whether you do that in a Christian language way or whether you do that in a different way, that's going to end up letting you down. But if you give yourself to God's bigger mission, there, there is genuine satisfaction to be found. There, there is genuine peace and joy and hope to be found. So we'll face obstacles every day as we go about our lives and seek to live obediently for Jesus. But when we show perseverance, when we keep praying, when we keep seeking after God's kingdom first, when we keep choosing to love our neighbours, to pray for our enemies, and I'm not advocating here, by the way, overworking or burning ourselves out by trying to do too much, but I am saying there is a need to keep that bigger mission in view all of the time. To remember that we're living for something far bigger than ourselves. We're living for the glory of God. We're living for his purposes. We're living for the purposes that he has on this earth. If you're part of this local church, hopefully you're signing up and living for the purposes and call that he's giving us here, more specifically as a local church family. Our work, as we seek his kingdom first, as we love our neighbours, as we take Jesus' great commission to go and tell others about how amazing Jesus is seriously, as we put these things first, that's where real satisfaction can be found. So in this life, just to wrap it all up, in this life, we are to expect trouble. It's not all going to be easy going. We must keep remembering Jesus, which is perhaps easier when life is going really well than the moments where we feel like we're sinking and we're drowning. And as well as remembering Jesus, we must persevere with this bigger mission for his purposes. While we expect trouble, it's only in him and living for him that we'll find that true satisfaction and peace. So I'm just going to invite uh, Ben and Joanna to come back up. We're just going to sing one more song and there's going to be a chance for us to just pray and respond uh, before we go to tea and coffee. So if you'd like to stand.